quick promo break here in this episode. If you've been a fan of our podcast, you've probably already heard me, Tyler, one of your hosts, talk about the Naboso insoles. If you are ever wondering about, oh, what are insoles? How do they help my feet? Are they really useful? I got to tell you that I've been wearing these duo insoles for probably a year and a half now, and I think they're game changers. If you sit at a desk, if you are on your feet, so basically anybody or anybody in the world, they can really help with your health. If you ever have foot pain or if you have any type of issues with your feet, these can be a game changer for you. Hopefully you take my word on it. You head to the link in the description, you buy yourself a pair and you come back and you share it that, oh, I actually bought those insoles and they actually do work. You know, that'd be something that we'd love to hear, love to see, because that means that you're working on your health. That's it for the promo break. Let's get back to the episode and keep hearing about all the random things that Ron has to say. Welcome in on an instant reaction episode in the Movie Buffs podcast. My name is Tyler, and in this episode, I'm going to be going over Argyle. Now, this is, I believe, my first instant reaction episode in the new year. Last week, I released a rankings video of holiday movies, and I'm pretty behind in terms of content. And I mentioned in that episode that it's been a busy start to the year for me. Movie podcasting is a, a hobby of mine, and sometimes work just uh, has higher priority. As if you have a family or if you're trying to start a family, any of those things, you know that the hobbies sometimes take a backseat. And a part of that as well was that we just hadn't, haven't gone to the movies. And I think that's more of the quality movies that could be from the strikes. There's not as many quality movies coming out. And I'm actually going to be talking about that a little later on in this issue with marketing and getting people into the the theaters. So those are pieces that I'm going to mention with Argyle. If you are new to the Movie Boss podcast, but specifically these instant reaction episodes, these episodes are spoiler free ish. Typically, I say ish because sometimes I get a little over over myself or too much into <laughs> what I'm talking about, and sometimes things slip. So keep that in mind with other episodes in the Movie Buzz podcast. In this one, what I laid out, there's not really much that's going to ruin it, or in terms of what happens in the movie and the twist is already out there. I think. Um, I forgot what account, uh, kind of ruined it already for people, but keep that in mind with instant reaction episodes, spoiler free ish, because they are meant to get people to go watch a movie. If I think it's worth it. And I'm actually going to talk about that too, if, in terms of, is this movie worth going to the theaters? So, uh, before I get into all that stuff, I have to say, thank you for listening. There's a lot of podcasts out there, especially even in the, the movie realm. So I appreciate you taking the time to listen to the Movie Buffs podcast. Take the time to potentially like it, all that kind of good stuff. If you are listening on Spotify or Apple Podcast, if you can take a second to head over to the Movie Buffs YouTube channel and smash that subscribe button. And you can also catch up on any episodes that you miss. I'm going to start this episode a little differently here. And I'm going to talk about who will like this movie because that kind of relates to what I was saying in terms of getting people to go to the theaters. I, I I mean this honestly, that I don't think every movie fan or every spy movie fan is going to enjoy this movie. I think that this particular type of spy-ish movie is probably more suited to general audiences than the dark, gritty, real-life spy movies that potentially you see with James Bond movies. I say potentially because... James Bond movies, they're not real. They are fictitious, but of course people like those elements of realism in them that it could potentially happen at any point. And so with this movie, I think that if you like dark, gritty, realistic-ish movies, you're probably not going to like that. But if you are part of general pop and you like fun movies, comedy movies, or even if even specifically, if you like Matthew Vaughn movies, and I'm going to talk about some of the movies that he's done in the past, I think that you will like it, and it is worth then going to the movie. So there we go. Hits that caveat that I mentioned before with instant reaction episodes. Let's discuss the cast and crew here. Director Matthew Vaughn, as I mentioned, 
he did movies like Kick Ass, X Men First Class, The Kingsman, and he's kind of de- and he is developing this Kingsman universe, this uh, universe that's prior to the the first one that came out, and they have uh, potentially a series coming out, and um, I'm, there's some things that I'm st- jumping around here because I don't want to. Uh, give away a spoiler here, but those are movies that he's done. If you like those types of movies, you will potentially or most likely like this movie in general. Do I think it's the best one? No. Out of all the ones I just talked about? No, but it is watchable. The crew in this one, so the cast, Henry Cavill, Dua Lipa, John Cena, Bryce Dallas Howard, Sam Rockwell, Brian Cranston, and Samuel L. Jackson. Let me give you the IMDb storyline here. Ellie Conway, an introverted spy novelist who seldom leaves her home, is drawn into a real world of espionage when the plot of her books gets a little too close to the activities of a sinister underground syndicate. When Aiden, a spy, shows up to save her, he says, from being kidnapped or killed or both, Ellie and her beloved cat Alfie are plunged into a covert world where nothing and no one is what it seems. So... This movie, uh, and this is where I'm segueing into here, is based on the real life author Ellie Conway's fourth book released earlier this year. And I saw part of this when I was looking it up, if this was based on a, on a book. Somebody, I think one of the headlines was, how can this movie be based on a book that hasn't even released yet? I don't know. I, I thought that was just funny that people, that that's one of the headlines that they'd put out there. Who cares? I mean, it's not real. It's fictitious. They probably just drew from some of the concepts from it. I don't know. I didn't read the book, but people get all all up in a stir about things these days. And so if you are interested in learning more potentially about the story, I believe my wife is, you know, listen to this book. She listens to audiobooks and she's in the laugh when she, she hears that in this episode. I said she listens to books. She doesn't read books. She listens to books. And I'm going to now get into one of the bigger topics in this episode, and that is the issue with the marketing of it. Because that was one of the big things I, I had an issue with. And I mentioned that in a reply to an account on X or on Twitter when this account asked what people thought about it. And this was my main issue with the movie is that the movie is marketed as Henry Cavill, Dua Lipa, and John Cena are f- uh, center stage. I think Samuel L. actually. And I remember when I went on to IMDb, the banner that was on it, I think it's Henry Cavill in the middle, Dua Lipa's on his right, and then Samuel L.'s on the other side. And my issue with this is that they are not really big parts of the movie. They are um, a part of it in a way that, I mean, Maybe altogether their scenes add up to three minutes. Honestly, I, I'm thinking out loud here, but they were not really a big, big part of the movie. And the big part, the main actress, actor is Bryce Dallas Howard. She is the main actress in this movie, and she, I feel like she's like the third, she's like the third person in this banner off to the side. And as you go back further, it gets blurry and blurry in this image. And she's the main person in this movie and yet she's not center stage in the marketing for it and that might be because uh, they're trying to hide what the twist is with this movie and like I mentioned before there's an account out I forgot which one it was it's one of those Hollywood reporting ones that mentioned what this movie what the twist in this movie is I'm not going to say it because I don't feel like it's worth it, but it, the, the twist is already out there. I don't think it, um, it kind of does ruin. I knew it before going into this one, but she is the main actor, actress in this movie, and yet she's not front stage. That's my issue with this, and I think that that goes part of the marketing that you see these days with movies is they try to trick people into getting to the theaters, and when you're tricking people, instead of focusing on what actually draws people to the theater. I think that you're going down a path that is only going to get worse. And then you create these, these discussions. Why aren't movie people going to the movies? Why aren't people? And once you go down that path, I think that all of a sudden you're going to get to a place where uh, studios are not putting out even more movies because they think that whatever they, whatever issues that they're coming up with are the ones, instead of looking at, why are we poorly marketing these movies? Why are we uh, continuing to let people that 
market these movies poorly, continue to have these jobs. There are people out there that I'm sure are much better marketers and could actually put forth <laughs> content that is going to get people in the seats. Some examples that I came up with is Pixar. I have a big issue with Pixar marketing these days. I don't, I don't have issue with the, the movies that they're making. It's the marketing. If you think back to when Coco was coming out, what was the big draw in my mind when you saw trailers? It was the visuals, how they were creating these amazing universes, these scenes uh, with with graphics and the 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 content that they were creating, how intricate it was, all these little details going into a trailer. And when you saw it on screen, I remember when they uh, they flashed to this uh, <laughs> the world that he he went to, the dead world that he went to. It was amazing. And you're like, oh my goodness, I want to see that. I want to go to the theater and see that. And when I think about the last movie that came out from Pixar, Pixar Wish, they tried to lean into the, the comedy of it. And it just continued to get older and older in terms of this is not even funny. Why are you showing this? When I, I'm sure there are scenes in that movie that are gra- in terms of the graphics and the visuals that I'm sure are amazing. I mean, they have a star on it, a wishing upon a star or something like that. But I'm sure there are is some scene in there that is just mind blowing when you see it. Another example here with Pixar was in that movie Elemental. I, in no marketing pieces for Elemental did I see anything about. There's a scene where when they go underwater and then they find I, I don't know what kind of flower it was, but it's just, there's under, underwater flower and it is graphic. The graphics in it, the visuals in it are just stunning. You see, and you're like, oh my goodness, wow, that looks really great. My first thought when I saw it, I was like, I wish I saw that on the big screen. I bet that looks amazing. But yet they try to lean into these areas that are not going to get people to go to the theaters when they just then when they know that they can just wait a couple months and it's gonna come on to streaming. Now, uh, another more relevant, another one that they're out there that my wife brought up to me, and she uh she talks about with um, with Mean Girls, but then also with Wonka, how Mean Girls is not supposedly being marketed as a musical despite it being one. I didn't know that one. I was, I'm not that interested in seeing Mean Girls in general. Um, I didn't, my first thought of it was who's asking for this movie? Is it really something that people are like begging for? I don't know, but it's not enough to get me to go to the theaters. And I like the original Mean Girls. I've seen it plenty of times. I believe we own it on Apple TV, potentially on DVD as well. And then with Wonka, we're going into that. I believe they didn't say it was a a musical, but there are musical elements of Wonka. And I thoroughly enjoyed that movie. So getting back to these issues with marketing, I think that there's too much with trying to trick people to get into the theater with creating trailers and who's a part of a movie. I feel like they were trying too much to lean into Henry Cavill being center stage with, with trying to get people to go see this one when he's not really a part of the movie. So that is one of the big pieces of this episode. And if you have some feedback on it, I'd love to hear what you think about it because I, I think that's a, that's a conversation that just continues to grow and hopefully they write the ship with that one. The next piece that I thought with this ep- with this episode that I thought was kind of interesting was, and this was something that when we were driving out of the theaters, <clears throat> excuse me there, was, is Matthew Vaughn a James Gunn with lesser quality scripts? Now, I know Matthew Vaughn potentially does have his hand in writing these scripts, so then it's potentially a, a bigger discussion than what I'm talking about here. But in terms of music, integration with action. One of the things that I like that Matthew Vaughn does, his camera movement with his movies is is up there, in my opinion. I Ever since, and I've talked about this one in different episodes, ever since I watched this behind the scenes from, um, who was it? Chad Stahelski, one of the d- directors and from the uh, John Wick series and in terms of when he was talking about action scenes and the art form of it, in camera movement, I feel like I became a little more snobbish with fight scenes and the work that goes into it. And I remember I did see a behind the scenes with Matthew Vaughn when he was talking about the first Kingsman and he was talking about how much work went into the action scenes that they created. And it pays off in my in my mind. It pays off big time. And there is that that flair that he has 
uh, in, that you've seen in previous movies. And my issue with the King's Man movie, the prequel that came out, was there wasn't much action in that. And you go to see his movies for that. So with saying, is Matthew Vaughn a lesser James Gunn? I think there's elements of James Gunn's style, his flair, his integration with music and all that, and the story. And I mean, it, it, his movies are fun to watch. You ha- you enjoy from start to beginning the uh, the story that's put forth and the character v- development. And I would say I don't think that they're uh, they're a match, but I think that you could see similarities that people enjoy to watch. And that's why I believe his movies, Matthew Vaughn, his movies are different and being different in a good way. They're not different to be artsy or to, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but I mean that his movies are are creative that you're not watching the same thing that another director can pull off or another director and his team can pull off, which I think is very, um, it's probably why he was given such a big budget for this movie. I think that uniqueness is something that we've sometimes lost in, uh, in going to movies. So let me give you some trivia. And these were just ones that I pulled off IMDb. As I say, each time, who knows if, uh, if there is some elements, uh, that are just uh, flubbed in this, I believe anybody can put in the trivia for this, but I got, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, five trivia items that, uh, will hopefully entice you to go see this movie. First one here, Matthew Vaughn cast Henry Cavill because he needed someone who was born to play James Bond, which Henry is. And then then the the Nick, what's this then? Then Nick, him from Bond Studio did. I I think that's a typo that doesn't make sense there. Cavill was in fact a finalist to play Bond in Casino Royale, but was rejected for being too young. Young, he was then 22. I could add on to that one. Um, how Matthew Vaughn's first movie that he did was Layer Cake, which has Daniel Craig in it. And I believe it was Layer Cake, which was the movie that um, Barbara uh, Broccoli, Broccoli, whatever her last name is, from MGM Studios, that I believe that was the movie she saw, which enticed her to cast uh, Daniel Craig in that one. So made my own little trivia there. Next one, Elfie the Cat is played by Chip, owned by Matthew Vaughn's wife, Claudia Schiffer. I threw that one in there because, dang, Matthew Vaughn, wife's, his wife is Claudia Schiffer. Pretty nice there. <laughs> Matthew Vaughn secured the rights to the Beatles song Now and Then, a year before it was released. The song was being developed by Giles Martin, the son of longtime Beatles producer Sir George Martin. And Giles also served as music producer in Argyle. Vaughn recalled I with Guile. And I said, I'm really struggling to find what I call the romantic song in the movie because I need it to be sad but hopeful. And he said, do you want to hear a new Beatles song? And Giles had, has got a hell of a sense of humor. So I was like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And he goes, no, I'm being deadly serious. He played it to me and it was as if Lennon had seen the film. We just slapped it on the movie and we didn't have to edit anything. It just fit. It fitted the picture. Interesting there. And that's why I put it there. Argyle is named after the limo driver from the first Die Hard movie. Bryce Dallas Howard cited Taylor Swift as inspiration for her character, explaining she's a cat lady. She's got this awesome backpack with a cat in it that she walks around with. She loves a good Argyle sweater. And there's a sort of unapologetic dorkiness about her. So interesting trivia there that maybe entices you. For the, the, one of the last pieces here that I'm going to talk about before I wrap this up, definitely stay for the end credit scene. There is something in there. And I was actually surprised when I saw that new rock stars on YouTube did a breakdown of this movie. And they kind of just pulled the pieces together to um, help it make a little more sense. The end scene, you'll probably walk away thinking, huh? What? What? Like, what did it, well, how does all this stuff go together? Just stay and watch for it. As I mentioned in the beginning, in terms of who this movie and who would potentially like it, if you like Matthew Vaughn movies, like I said, you'll probably enjoy it. And you might enjoy it in the theater. There are some cool visuals in it. I think that the one that's popping on my mind, one of the end credit scenes, or sorry, not the end credit scenes, one of the last fights in it, the last two fights, and I believe this was one of the uh, the issues that somebody on Twitter had issue with is the last third of the movie and I could see that but there are visuals a part of it that you know I feel like are Matthew Vaughn's style that you've seen in the Kingsman movies that really are unique they're fun 
And I mean, the, I heard people laughing throughout the movie. It sounded like they enjoyed it. So if you like that type of spy movie, go see it or wait for streaming because you're probably going to see all the negativity that's out there already about this movie. But this has been a movie. Uh, this has been, there we go, a episode in the Movie Boost podcast, instant reaction episode. Hopefully you enjoyed it and I will catch you in the next one. Thank you.